up striving and Compassions never fail. Your compassions never fail. Your compassions never fail.
Well, good morning, friends. Welcome to River Heights. It is good to see you here this morning. I'm glad to have you be part of our service. Uh, my name is Justin. I'm one of the worship leaders around here. Uh, I have the privilege of being able to join with my friends here as we uh, sing some songs together. And I invite you to stand as you are able. And we are going to start by singing a couple of those songs. Um, and as we're getting situated, we're going to open with a quick word of prayer. Lord Jesus, we just say thank you for the ways that you are moving in this community, the ways that you're moving around us and in our lives personally, in the lives of this church and in the community that surrounds us. God, we are grateful for how you do that. And we just invite you in this time and in this space this morning that you would come and have your way. We invite you, Holy Spirit, to just move on us, be among us, have your way in this time and draw us towards you. We are excited to see what you have for us this morning together. God, you are awesome. You spoke and created all things. Jesus, you're worthy. A wonder of unfailing love. Spirit, your power. You're filling us with presence and light. God, you are awesome. God, you are awesome. You spoke and created all things. Jesus, you're worthy. A wonder of Spirit's your power, you're building a 
house with peasants and lying. God, you are awesome. God, you are awesome. You spoke and created all things. Jesus, you're worthy. A wonder of unfailing love. Spirit, your power. Filling us with presence and light. Yes, Lord. We are so grateful that you are here with us. We invite you again just to have your way in this time and in this place. Lord, we just invite you here. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you bring me into this love that's always been. And my heart sings so loud, I want the world to hear it. If I had no brother, if I had no sister, no mother, no father, Rich and famous, a place for the weak and the strong to go. There's never an orphan. The door is open. Welcome home. Welcome home. Welcome home. Welcome home. Welcome home. Thank you, God, for making us all a family together.
It is so wonderful to worship together as a family. You guys can have a seat. Um, and now we have been so pleased to have um, the Real Hope Project, right? That's, I said that right. Okay, good. Shoot, I was second guessing myself. The Real Hope Project has come the last few years to tell us a little bit about, about what they do. And this is Pete from the Real Hope Project, and he is going to share some things with us. Everybody give it up for Pete. Good morning, everybody. My name is Pete Stanley, and together my wife Casey and I are the founders of the Real Hope Project. And Real, Sh Real Hope has been able to share here um, a few times over the last several years, and I'm so excited to be back this morning. And hopefully some of what I share will be review, and hopefully some of it will be new. But for those of you who don't know, what we do at the Real Hope Project is we make short two or three minute super high quality videos of kids who are in the foster care system waiting to be adopted. Then we bring those videos around to churches and communities just like this one to try to find people who will think and pray about adopting from foster care. You can go to the next slide. In the United States right now, there are about 400,000 kids in the foster care system and one in four of them cannot go home. They need to be adopted. In Minnesota, there are about 10,000 in foster care and 1,000 of them need to be adopted. And I'd like to introduce you to one of them right now. You can play the video. I love guitar because when I play it, I feel complete and I like to feel the rhythm and the rhyme of the strings. Same reason why I like playing piano is because you have to feel the music. The hardest thing about learning a guitar is focusing on both hands while playing. I listen to Metallica, Guns N' Roses, basically the 60s through 90s rock. But what it means to be an artist is to create something in your own image, something unique, something fascist, something interesting in your own desires. Really be just fascinated by your own creations. I like fishing because the patience, and it's like my coping skill, because I also like like catching things on a line and just like holding a living creature in my hand. My favorite graphic novel is Wings of Fire. What's it about? Basic. Just over a few. Dragons. <laughs> I would describe myself as curious, outgoing, happy, shy, curious and like engineering. I'm definitely a tinkerer. I was just like putting things together and taking things apart. What I say about three of my best skills Focusing on the objective I had, playing piano, and learning to trust somebody. Uh, what makes a close friend of me is somebody that always has my back, cares about me, watches out for me, and not thinking they'll ever walk away. When I think of family, I think of like lifetime relations, like they've always been there for me. Basically with a family, I'd like to hike, hunting together, crossbow fishing, stuff like that I've never done. I'm a thrill seeker. I would like to jump out of planes, paraglide, so I'd love to do that. When I think about adoption, I think of another person putting their arms open to take care of me just like family and friends would. My name is Caden. I am 15, and this is Mario. Hmm? I'm just kidding. <laughs> Um, at The Real Hope Project, we believe that there is nothing more powerful than a story. We believe God wants to tell a new story around adopting and foster care in Minnesota. And we have a lot to celebrate this morning. In the years that Real Hope has been around, we've been able to make 380 reels for 414 kids. And we have seen 208 of those kids get matched with families. Thank you. Yeah. Amen. God is on the move in Minnesota. God is on the move. In fact, if you are over the age of 12 in Minnesota and you are waiting to be adopted, the likelihood that that will happen is about 25%. So we can see that having a real effectively doubles the likelihood of a kid being adopted out of foster care. God's writing a new story. And not just in Minnesota. You can go to the next slide, please. In the last year or so, year and a half, we have begun expanding into different states through the total leadership of the Holy Spirit. Um, we have obviously our base here in the Midwest, and we're expanding to states nearby and then out, um, out west in, in uh, the Rocky Mountain region. 
and we're starting to tell stories of kids out there, and we're seeing kids get matched with families now across the country, which is so exciting. So for a few minutes, I'm going to have a video play quietly behind me of just some of the kids that we've been able to tell the stories of. And I want to take a few minutes to help dispel a couple of the more common myths that we hear surrounding adoption from foster care. The first myth is that, oh, I would love to adopt from foster care, but it's just too expensive, which is not true. Adopting from foster care in Minnesota can be virtually free if you know the right avenues to take. And if you have questions, I would love to chat at the table after service. The second myth is that kids are in foster care because they're bad or they did something wrong. Absolutely not true. Every kid in foster care is the victim of either neglect or abuse. They're in foster care because someone important in their life didn't have the tools or resources necessary to take care of them, not because they're bad. And the third myth, and the one that we hear by far the most often, is I would love to adopt from foster care, but I'm just too old, which we're hearing from people who are like 36, okay? Calm down. <laughs> and secondly, the, the kids that we make videos for don't need to be raised from infancy. They need someone to help them finish high school, apply for college, their first apartment. They need somewhere to go home on Thanksgiving and Christmas because family doesn't end when you're 18. Family is forever. And lastly, I think the I'm too old reason is a little bit ironic, considering that there are multiple stories of people in the Bible telling God that they were too old to have kids, and then God was like, blammo, kids. So I would just rethink that before you tell God that that's your reason. And the final myth is that every kid in foster care needs to be adopted. Also not true. Like I said, in Minnesota, there are about 10,000 kids in foster care on any given day. And a thousand of them, yes, do need to be adopted. But for most, the goal of foster care is reunification with their biological family. The goal of foster care is to give mom and dad enough time and resources to get back on their feet and get ready to care for the kids in their home. You can go to the next slide, please. So there are a few different ways I'd like you all to think and pray about joining with us this morning. And before I do that, if you could take your phones out and open up a text message to the number that you see behind me. 833-756-2038. Get your phone, open up a text to that number, and I'll tell you what we'll do with that in just a second. So the first and most obvious way I'd like you all to consider joining with us is think about adoption. Go on our website, come back to the table, watch some reels, meet some kids, and see if God stirs anything in your heart toward adopting from foster care. And I realize that not everyone is called or ready to adopt right now, but we are all called to care for these kids. So if you can't adopt, then consider moving upstream with us. We're telling stories about foster care or foster care prevention, respite care, things like that. And if you have questions, again, we'd love to chat after service at the table. If you can't adopt or move upstream, then please consider giving. We travel around the state to make and to share these videos, and everything we do costs money. So if you can do 10 bucks a month or 20 bucks a month, Anything will go a long way toward helping us reach our goal of making a video for every waiting kid in Minnesota. So if any of those three things are stirring in your heart, take a few minutes to think and pray about that. And if you want to respond, just text in the word family to that number. Adopt, upstream, or give. And together, let's make families happen. Thank you all so much. Lord, thank you for the work you are doing, trying to place kids who want homes and families with homes and families. And thank you so much for Real Hope, who saw that need and saw what you wanted to do in this world and is connecting the two together. God, please provide. Provide families who want those kids. Provide kids for those families. And Holy Spirit, come in this world. We love you. Amen. Hi, my name is Becca, and I am one of the pastors on staff here at River Heights Vineyard. Hello, my name is Margaret. And you are one of the kids on staff at River Heights Vineyard? Yes. 
I go to SNARF <laughs> meetings, so I think that counts. She does sometimes. Yeah, it's pretty great. So welcome, especially here. If, if you're here for the first time, she's not a paid staff child. Uh, but thank you so much for being here, especially if you are here for the first time. And if you are, Pete would love to meet you after the service at the Welcome Center. We have a free gift to say thank you for coming to spend your Sunday morning with us. And there's chocolate in it, so meet Pete after the service so you can get that. Our purpose here at River Heights Vineyard is, you want, it, you want this one? Yes. To love God, to love people, and change the world. Yeah. And every Sunday morning, we have the opportunity to give towards that purpose. You can give electronically through PushPay. There's info on the screen above me. Or you can give cash and checks in the connection card boxes as you leave the room today. So let's pray over those gifts. God, thank you. Thank you that you are here and you are working in the world today. And thank you that we get to be part of it. God, multiply these gifts so that we can do the work that you have for us, so we can be in the world exactly who you have wanted and created us to be. We love you, Lord. Amen. Please take out your connection card from your program in first service. Apparently, Pete was looking for his. He didn't know that I always steal Pete's when I come up to do this, but this time I did not steal yours. Um... We love to interact with people. First, let us know that you're here. Sign this. Give us as much information as you want to. But we also love to engage with you on these connection cards. On the back, there are two sections called the prayer requests and the God stories. Margaret, tell us a little about prayer requests. So if you need someone to pray for you at the church, urge, you can write it down as many prayers as you need, and the prayer team will pray for them, all of them. Every week, the prayer team and pastoral staff pray for those. What kinds of things do you pray for? The things you need. Yeah, we pray for basic needs sometimes, and we'll join you in praying for those. There's also the God stories. Margaret, what's that about? So if you want to share how God helps you, you can write it down, and, and then we know how God helped you, so we can thank God for helping you. So that's something we can celebrate and mourn together as a community when you share the God stories, because they get put up on the screen before and after service, and so people can read with your full name, with just your initials, or you can be anonymous if there's something where God met you or where you need God to meet you to share. We have our connection class coming up on Sunday, April 14th at 1 o'clock. So if you're looking for a church home in ways that might help you connect, our membership classes are the opportunity to get to know more about River Heights Vineyard and to meet some of our staff members and connect to other people who are already attending River Heights too. Connect, belong, and grow can be taken in any order. Each class has both teaching and discussion, so Connect is being offered on April 14th again at 1 p.m. There's child care available, so sign up on your connection card and let us know if you're coming. Holy Spirit Night, Friday, April 19th, 7 to 9 p.m. at RHV. We believe the presence. presence of guidance and Holy Spirit is what every Christian needs. The Holy Spirit night will make space for three best ways to express God. Worship, prayer, and community. We have time to attend and worship, music, and short talk. The uh, opportunity to receive prayer has been a powerful experience for our, our community. We'd love to have you experience Holy Spirit nights with us. So right now, we actually have a God story to share in video. A couple months ago, we had a couple people come and do a video of what God had been doing in their lives. And it was one of those times where in staff meeting the, the Tuesday after, both Gay and Pete were like, I love our church so much. I just feel great because they got to sit and listen to everyone's God story. And the whole idea is that we are wanting to share these stories every once in a while with each other as a community for church. And my friend Andrew is going to share his today. I've definitely seen God work in my life when I was um, living hours away from my family and and uh, I lived in Fargo for a little while, and 
um, struggled with alcohol for quite a bit. Uh, I had a very loving mother and younger sister praying for me, and even as far away as they were, uh, they still were caring for me, praying for me, and I had a youth group leader in um, high school, and I kept in touch with him, and I, I had no idea up until I was uh, talking to him about how I had struggled with drinking, and I found out he had been an alcoholic for years. It was good to have somebody that's been there and understand, understood how tough that was, and someone that cared about me and has known me for a while, what that's like. Uh, I moved back here, and once I moved back and stopped drinking, it's been eight years, um, I had, uh, my life was completely different. I found a job where I began to help build a company that's now uh, supporting a lot of people, and been my wife because of that. And believe it or not, my wife is allergic to alcohol, which is was hilarious. That was the key thing to me. And that was God saying, yeah, this is definitely the perfect woman for you. Coming to River Heights, I enjoy coming into a place where I love to, love to be around everybody here and getting to help build a place that's making a better place for people to experience God together and hearing them worship the Lord or whether it's in, in youth group and seeing kids connect with God and each other and just feel a little bit uplifted. It's a very fulfilling thing and has been very satisfying and a fun part of my life. God, we thank you for the work that you're doing in Andrew's life, for how you have already worked through his life and done such good stuff, and how he's such a gift to us, God. We ask that you would just bless and sustain him and his family, and uh, we're just grateful for it. Amen. Please take a moment say hi to somebody near you. I will preach a message forthwith. Good morning, everybody. Happy Sunday after Easter. I am glad to be together today. It is my hope that you will experience God's love and presence in our service and in this message today. We get to start a new series this week. This one is from the Old Testament, which we have not preached out of in a good while. The Old Testament is the Jewish scriptures that were written long before the time of Jesus. And what we're going to do is we're going to preach through the lives of two great figures of the Bible, Joseph and Moses. You may have heard of them. And I'm especially interested during this series in how God uses them to set people free. First, bringing God's people to Egypt to rescue them, and then later rescuing them from Egypt, where they've been put into slavery. God has always been in the business of rescue. Amen? God is still in the work of setting people free from oppression. God's moving among us. I know people in this church right now today that God has been setting free from addiction, that God has been helping grow through and beyond mental health challenges that looked insurmountable, people finding joy and connection after enduring depression and toxic family systems that had them on a very different trajectory. It is my hope that as we preach through these stories of liberation, God will be rescuing and setting free the people among us, which might include you, who need freedom for any reason. I'm going to pray as we open this series. God, we ask that you'd open our ears to your word. We ask that you would encourage our preaching team as we preach from a different kind of stories. And I pray, God, that you would be setting free our whole congregation, that every person who comes would have a testimony of how you have reached into our lives and set us free. We trust you for this, God. Amen. 
So we're going to start with Joseph's story. We're going to be hearing about that for a number of weeks coming. And it is a super tragic story today in particular, although it does end with rescue and reconciliation. Joseph goes through grief and loss that would end most people. But at the end of the story, he speaks words that inform the whole story. And our title for the series is, comes from this. In Genesis 50, 20, Joseph says, You intended to harm me, but God intended it all for good. He brought me to this position so I could save the lives of many people. And what we see in this story is that no matter how horrible life goes for Joseph, and it does, God actually uses it for good. And that's what I hope you'll hear for yourself today in the Word and directly from God. No matter what happens in your life, no matter how hard the circumstances or the suffering, God can use it for good. Now, does that mean God's the one inflicting the suffering? For the record, my perspective is that God is not the one inflicting the suffering in this story. The people in this story are stupid enough to do all this stuff on their own. Joseph's behavior leads to some of his problems, and the people around him make evil choices that harm him. But what God does is use the bad intentions of some of these people to grow Joseph into the kind of person who can actually rescue a nation. Joseph was always going to suffer at the hands of his own family, but because of God's intervention, he becomes a genuine world changer. And I think a lot of the hope in today's story can be found here. As Joseph faces challenges and grows through them, we see God's hand, and it is God's plan that everything in your life would contribute to your eternal growth instead of to your dis diminishment. And so what I'd like you to do is consider the challenges of your life during this series and take a look at how God uses Joseph's trials for good instead of evil because God wants to do the same for you. As background for Joseph's story, it's helpful to know a little bit of what's already happened. Earlier in Genesis, a man named Abraham chose to follow God. And God has promised a blessed land to Abraham and descendants as numerable as the sand on the beach or the stars in the sky. And among these descendants is Jacob. And Jacob is Joseph's father. Jacob was beloved of his mom but did not get on well with his dad. And he has a long history of deception. He's called the deceiver. As an example, while his dad's dying, his dad wants to give a blessing to his favorite kid. And so he pretends to be his brother by wearing his clothes. And him and his mom kill a goat and put the fur on his arms and pretend that that fur is his brother's hairy arm because his dad is going blind and reaches out to touch him to make sure who it is. And so his mother is actually helping Jacob play off against his other brothers against his father. And that history of deception in Jacob's life actually echoes into today's story too, which we'll start right now. We're going to start with Genesis 37, verse 2. This is the account of Jacob and his family. When Joseph, his son, was 17 years old, he often tended his father's flocks. He worked for his half-brothers, the sons of his father's wives, Bilhah and Zilpah. But Joseph reported to his father some of the bad things his brothers were doing. Okay, so we see a few things about Joseph here. He's the youngest, he has a different mother than his half-brothers, and he's a tattletale. How much are tattletales appreciated by the world around them? Is anyone in this room besides me raising a tattletale? I got three kids, and one of them, who I shall not name, just takes unbelievable joy in tattling at every opportunity possible, despite the fact that her dad generally responds with, Stop it. People won't like you if you keep on doing this. Has anybody ever here ever tattled and found out how much other kids love that? I, I was not. I was the one getting tattled on. I don't think I was ever good enough to be the tattletale, right? And kids don't like a tattletale. They don't like it when they're kids, and people don't like it when they're adults either, right? So let's see how this affects Joseph's relationships. We'll start with verse 3 here. Jacob, his dad, loved Joseph more than any of his other children, because Joseph had been born to him in his old age. And so one day, Jacob had a special gift made for Joseph, a beautiful robe. But his brothers hated Joseph because their father loved him more than the rest of them. They couldn't say a kind word to him. 
And so we see Joseph's a tattletale, which kids don't like, and he's the youngest kid. Everybody knows the youngest has it easy. I'm an oldest. Any other oldests in here? We blazed a trail for you people, okay? Right? He has a different mother, and his father especially loves him more than his brothers. There are a ton of reasons here for his siblings not to like him. And in fact, it says they hate him. And that had to have been super hard for Joseph. He's adored by his father and despised by all his older brothers, and he has a ton of them. Verse 5. One night, Joseph had a dream. And when he told his brothers about it, they hated him more than ever. Listen to this dream, he said. We were out in the field tying up bundles of grain. Suddenly, my bundle stood up, and your bundles all gathered around and bowed low before mine. His brothers responded, so you think you're going to be our king, do you? Do you think you're actually going to reign over us? And they hated him all the more because of his dreams and the way he talked about them. And so it's just very clear in the early part of the story that Joseph is just plain not very smart or very wise. He has a low likelihood of being liked by other people. He works for his half-brothers, and they're his family at a time in the world where you don't leave your family, you don't go away to college. This is the people you're going to live with for the rest of your life. Why would you tell them about this dream? That's insane. If you ever have a dream that you're the best person in the whole world and all the people in your life bow down to you, maybe don't share that one. You know? <laughs> maybe don't share it with the people bowing to you in the dream. Okay? Joseph has what I would call pretty bad character at this point in the story. I have a favorite comedian. Her name is uh, Taylor Tomlinson, and she's quite young, and she did a bit when she was in her 20s. I think she just hit 30. She's old now. Um, I think she did a bit in her 20s where she said, you know, I'm in my 20s, and what I love about that is we don't have any responsibility. But do you know why that is? It's because we're not good at anything. We haven't done anything yet. We have no experience. People can barely trust us to drive a car, much less buy a house and raise children, right? And what I see a lot in Joseph's life is that as a young man, he has a lot of character difficulties that can plague us when we are young. He is a tattletale. He tells people who already don't like him that maybe he's going to rule over them in the end. And it gets worse in verse 9. Soon Joseph had another dream. And again, he told his brothers about it. Listen, I've had another dream, he said. The sun, the moon, and 11 stars bowed low before me. This time he told the dream to his father as well as his brothers. But his father scolded him. What kind of dream is that, he asked. Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow to the ground before you? But while his brothers were jealous of Joseph, his father wondered what the dreams meant. Now, my dad was a very good and gentle man, and I don't think it would have gone super well if I told him I had a dream that you and mom and my brothers were bowing down before me. I just don't think that's the kind of thing you say to people, right? What we see here is this story of dysfunctional families, which starts from the first family in the Bible. Anybody ever heard of Cain and Abel and Adam and Eve? And the story is just super consistent through the Old Testament and into the New Testament. Jacob, Joseph's father, is a deceiver. And he grows up and Jacob's kids are either doing bad stuff or tattling on each other for doing bad stuff. Was anyone here ever told by your parents, I hope your kids are just as bad as you? Anybody besides me? Did anyone grow up with kids who are just as bad as you besides me? <laughs> It came true, Mom. Here's my prayer. Lord, give better kids to my kid. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, make them not like me, Lord, please. All right? Can anybody in here identify with being raised in a dysfunctional family? Right? As one commentator puts it from Working Preacher, which is a site from my seminary, the dysfunction in Joseph's family stems not from any one source, but rather from the brokenness of all parties. Is anyone besides me in a dysfunctional willing to say, dysfunctional family willing to say amen, that's me too? We all got the broken stuff. That's why we're so dysfunctional. As we're going to see, the dysfunction actually gets way worse. And one of the great things about this story is that it shows what God can do with and for and in and through dysfunctional families. Because I don't know how many perfect families there are for God to use. <laughs> 
Thank God he can use ours. I know no family's perfect, although all the other families when I was a kid looked better to me. But the family in question today is actually about as broken as any of us would ever see. And I think that's super comforting because my family's been pretty broken at times. And yet God keeps seeing us through too. Let's see what happens next to this one. Verse 12. Soon after this, Joseph's brothers went to pasture their father's flocks at Shechem. When they had been gone for some time, Jacob said to Joseph, Your brothers are pasturing the sheep at Shechem. Get ready, and I will send you to them. I'm ready to go, Joseph replied. Go and see how your brothers and the flocks are getting along, Jacob said. Then come back and bring me a report. And so Jacob sent him on away, on his way. Joseph traveled to Shechem from their home in the valley of Hebron. When he arrived there, a man from the area noticed him wandering around the countryside. What are you looking for? He asked. I'm looking for my brothers, Joseph replied. Do you know where they're pasturing their sheep? Yes, the man told him. They've moved on from here. But I heard them say, let's go to Dothan. And so Joseph followed his brothers to Dothan and found them there. When Joseph's brothers saw him coming, they recognized him in the distance. And as he approached, they made plans to kill him. Here comes the dreamer. They said, come on, let's kill him and throw him into one of these cisterns. We can tell our father a wild animal has eaten him. Then we'll see what becomes of his dreams. And here the story turns real dark. The brother's hatred has gone so deep, they are actually planning to kill their own brother. They're out in the wilderness, far from any other human beings. There are no forensic teams coming by for a DNA swab. This is just going to be everybody's word. And they have a story worked out that they can tell their father. They are angry with their brother for his tattling for his superiority complex that keeps coming out in his dreams, and they're ready to kill him, or at least talk about the idea. And they make it clear, it is his dreams that are the problem, and we are the final solution. Verse 21. But when Reuben, one of the brothers, heard of their scheme, he came to Joseph's rescue. Let's not kill him, he said. Why should we shed any blood? Let's just throw him into this empty cistern here in the wilderness, and then he'll die without us laying a hand on him. Reuben was secretly planning to rescue Joseph and return him to his father. So when Joseph arrived, his brothers ripped off the beautiful robe he was wearing. Then they grabbed him and threw him into the cistern, and now the cistern was empty. There was no water in it. Then, just as they were sitting down to eat, they looked up and saw a caravan of camels in the distance coming toward them. It was a group of Ishmaelite traders taking a load of gum, gum, balm, and aromatic resin from Gilead down to Egypt. Judah said to his brothers, what will we gain by killing our brother? We'd have to cover up the crime. Instead of hurting him, let's sell him to those Ishmaelite traders. After all, he is our brother, our own flesh and blood. And so the brothers agreed. And when the Ishmaelites, who were Midianite traders, came by, Joseph's brothers pulled him out of the cistern and sold him to them for 20 pieces of silver. And the traders took him to Egypt. Sometime later, Reuben returned to get Joseph out of the cistern, and when he discovered that Joseph was missing, he tore his clothes in grief. And then he went back to his brothers and lamented, the boy is gone. What will I do now? Then the brothers killed a young goat and dipped Joseph's robe in his blood. They sent the beautiful robe to their father with his message. Look what we found. Doesn't this robe belong to your son? And so the brothers decide to kill Jacob's favorite kid. And in doing so, his garment plays a huge role, like the garment Jacob wore to deceive his father into thinking he was Esau. They kill a young goat for its blood, just like Jacob killed a goat and used its skin to deceive his father. And then instead of killing him, it becomes more convenient to sell him into slavery. And in some ways, this story is about a deceiver reaping what he sows. Jacob lied to his father using a garment and the blood of a goat. And now his kids are lying to him. And they have done something that is unthinkable. Lots of us have been in dysfunctional families. Anybody been sold by your siblings into slavery? I recognize it's possible that's happened to someone in this church, but you got a special story if that's happened to you, you know? It was just Judah's intervention that kept him from killing him outright. And now they've sold their brother, and they've sent a bloody robe to their father. Let's return to the story in verse 33. Their father recognized it immediately. Yes, he said, that is my son's robe. Wild animal must have eaten him. Joseph has been torn to pieces. And then Jacob tore his clothes and dressed himself in burlap. 
And he mourned deeply for his son for a long time. His family all tried to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. I will go to my grave mourning my son, he would say. And then he would just weep. Meanwhile, the Midianite traders arrived in Egypt where they sold Joseph to Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. Potiphar was captain of the palace guard. That's the end of our passage for this week. Anybody feel good yet? Anybody feel like church gave me what I needed today and I'm ready to go face my week with the hope inherent in the word of God? Okay. <laughs> now, I raised my hand when I asked about dysfunctional families because I've got at least one, and many of us did. But just think of how this has gone for Joseph. He is working for his half-brothers who hate him. His father treats him better than them, guaranteeing their animosity. And he keeps sharing dreams that are definitely not going to help his relationships. He's put himself in a very dangerous place. He's proud and arrogant. He's a tattletale and he's unwise. And now his actions have put him in mortal danger. It is by the skin of his teeth that one brother made sure he did not get murdered. If you feel like your family background put you in a deep hole to start, Joseph's story is going to amaze you. Because God has a plan for everybody in this story, just like God has a plan for you. Jacob actually has another name, and his name was given to him after he wrestled an angel. God named him Israel. Does that ring a bell for anybody? God named the deceiver the name of the nation that would come and last for so long, it's still right there. Jacob, with all his faults and flaws, is going to be the father of nations, in part through Joseph. Now, each week during this series, it's my hope that we can make these ancient stories relatable and helpful to your life. And each week, we're also going to look for echoes of Jesus in these stories. And the echo is easy to find today. In today's story, God has a plan to rescue his people. I told you God always has a plan to rescue his people. And the plan is put into action in part through the betrayal of someone Joseph loves who sells him for silver, just like Jesus was betrayed by his friend Judas for 30 pieces of silver. Throughout the Bible, again and again, we see bad things happening because of people and their character and their choices. And we see how God reaches through past the evil and calls people to love and to service and to good things and rescues people for that purpose. It happened in Joseph's life, as we'll see in coming weeks. It happened in Jesus' life, too. Jesus was betrayed by the people closest to him. And he followed and honored God, and in the end, he was raised from the dead. Joseph's life is in many ways a test. Will the terrible things that other people do to destroy him be what win, or will he, with God's help, grow through them? Now, I don't want to spoil the story, but I'm pretty sure we wouldn't be preaching it if this was the end of the whole story, okay? <laughs> that would be like a low preaching chapter if that's all we knew about Joseph's life. But I want you to realize your life, too, is a test. Are you going to be diminished and made less by all the bad things that have happened to you and happened in your life and that you've done? Or is God going to come into your life and redeem the bad things that have happened to you? There's a passage in the Old Testament that I love. God will restore the years the locusts have eaten. And many of us have had some years eaten away. My locusts were addition, addiction and depression and wanting to kill myself. And I, I don't want those years back the way they were. But God gives them back better. God buys back our suffering and turns it into something valuable. I was not treated well as a kid, and I had all kinds of character problems that left me unliked by the people around me. And I went through depression, addiction, and loneliness, but God used those things. And it's actually because of how I was treated as a child that I have learned compassion. I did not know compassion as a kid. Because of my depression, God saved me and gave me a joy that blows my mind. And even the awfulness of COVID and the divorce I went through during it have turned into a home life that feel like an unbelievable gift from God. 
and that in just a few years. God wants to redeem your life. God wants to take all of who you are, all of what you've been through, and turn it into something good through which God can show the whole world who he is and how good he is and what he has to offer. I would love to come to God and be like, I got no problems, I'm good, what are we going to do together today? But almost all of my life, it's been, God, I'm a wreck, I need your help, is there anything you can do with this mess? And the story of how God turns that around and uses it for good is my story. I think it's the story that God has for every one of us. God wants to redeem all of your life, and maybe that can start or restart again today. I want to invite the worship team to come back forward or come back up here at this time. I want to invite you to stand as you're able. If you're on the prayer team, could you come stand up here? We would love to pray for you as the service moves forward. Not actually seeing any members of the prayer team as I kind of like gaze around the room. Do we have anybody here? We got a couple. Awesome. Never mind. I was blind. <laughs> Turn to your right, Pete. Okay. Thanks, guys. Um, I do like to share three tips. These are ways to put the Word of God into practice, something to read, something to pray, and something to do. And uh, I think the Word of God really lives when we put it into our lives. Tip number one is read Genesis 37. If you find the story interesting, you can keep reading. We're skipping a chapter, and if you read it, you'll get to know why. So, you know, maybe read the story of Joseph. Tip number two. Ask God for wisdom and good character. There are two ways to gain wisdom and good character. One is for God to give them to you. The other way is for you to learn them. Learning them is not awesome. <laughs> and so let's just go to God, who is the source of all wisdom and who has good character for us, and ask him to release those things into our lives. Let's receive those things from God. Tip number three, tell someone you're related to that you love them. Life is short. And it's very Minnesota to have passive resentment against our family. Let it stack up through the years and reach a point where you don't talk to each other except to yell, pass the turkey at Thanksgiving, right? That's very Minnesotan. An alternative way to be family is to be the person in your family who reaches out and says that you love people. And that might be hard in your family. Guarantee it's hard for everyone if it's hard for you. And maybe by being the first person to take a plunge, you can make a change for the better. That comes from God. Let's pray together, we'll worship, and the team will let us uh, walk us through communion, let us know when we're done. So God, I'm just thankful for these stories of people that I can relate to, and I'm thankful that in all these stories, you don't give up, you don't stop, you don't throw us away, you don't uh, look for better people. You use us, and you save us. And you rescue us, and then you give us a job to do, and that job includes rescuing the whole world with your help and your power. And so we offer ourselves to you, God. We ask that you would take us today, just as we are, with all our background. And we look to you to redeem the bad stuff that we have been through, that we have done, that's been done to us. We ask you to buy back all those years. We ask that you would turn them into love. Help us, God. We need your help. So as we sing this next song, I think this, Jesus talks about how the Holy Spirit was sent for us as our helper. So as we th consider some of these different places where we're stuck or we have the lasting baggage and things from dysfunction in whatever form, we have an opportunity today to say, Holy Spirit, come, be among us. You're welcome here. Help us in the places where we are at. Meet us in those spaces. And so with that, we just say, Lord, would you do that here this morning?
tasted and seen the sweetest of loves when my heart becomes free and my shame is undone your presence Lord Holy Spirit you are welcome here come flood this place and fill the atmosphere your glory God is what our hearts long for to be sweetest of loves when my heart becomes free and my shame is undone your presence Lord Holy Spirit you are welcome here come flood this place and
So each week we have the opportunity to receive communion together as a church family. This is an opportunity to remember what Jesus has given each of us and the promises that were made that he fulfilled. There's two tables in the front this morning and one in the back of the room, and these have unleavened bread and juice on them. These elements signify Jesus' sacrifice for each of us on the cross. On the night he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread and he gave thanks. He broke it and he gave it to his disciples and he said, take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And after supper, he took the cup of wine and he gave thanks. He gave it to them and he said, drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Dying, you destroyed our death. Rising, you restored our life. Lord Jesus, come in glory. It's through Christ and with Christ and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, that all honor and glory are yours, Almighty Father, forever and ever. Amen. You can go uh, up or back to the communion tables anytime during these next, uh, this next song. one. The lamb that was slaughtered, up from the grave he rose, ascended to glory, seated upon the throne. Jesus, there is no song of your heart is great. Beautiful Savior, you take my breath away. You fill me with wonder, what can I do but praise?
praise him. So as we wrap up here this morning, we ask Jesus that you would just continue to pour out your blessing and your presence on us, with us, through us. We invite you into this coming week. We acknowledge that we need you as we go through it, and we are so grateful for the ways that you redeem and restore even the most broken and difficult things. God, we ask your blessing over our time. We ask for your joy this week that would surprise us as we go. And so we say thank you in your name, Jesus. So bless you in the name of Jesus as we go this week. Uh, we're going to continue to sing for just a little bit. If you still have a, a prayer request or something that you'd like someone to pray with you, and there's absolutely still time for that, please come do that. Um, if you need to go, we understand that too. It's been wonderful to have you here with us this morning. Be blessed. Have a wonderful week, and we look forward to seeing you next week. Sing tender and mercy. Tender and mercy. Patient in all your ways, the author of kindness, the song of your heart is grace. Beautiful Savior, you take my breath away. You fill me with wonder. What can